Hello, this is Pastor Schuyler with Berean Baptist Church, and we are doing Bible studies through the Gospel of Mark. Our passage today is Mark chapter 3, picking up in verse 7, so let's dive right in. As we do that, I want to ask you a question, something to think about. From a biblical perspective, what is the essential difference between a fool and a wise person? The essential difference. We'll talk about it at the end. So, Mark chapter 3, picking up in verse 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. Jesus is withdrawing himself from the presence of the religious leaders that had come first to examine and then to accuse him. But a great multitude follow him. Follow him, And we should understand these not as the religious elite that at this point are in opposition to Jesus. We saw that in the last passage. But these are people from Galilee. Some of them are from Judea and Jerusalem. Some of them are from Idumea, which is uh, not quite a Jewish area at the time. Some of them are even from beyond Jordan, which we would today call the modern day country of Jordan, not at all ethnically pure Jewish. Some of them are from Tyre and Sidon, Gentile kingdoms by the sea, a great multitude. We should be understanding here that Jesus' following is not just among the, the purebred, respectable religious elites coming out of Jerusalem. Jesus' following is among the regular people. Some of them don't have the best backgrounds. Some of them don't have a pedigree. And they came when they heard what great things he did came unto him. It's really very sad, this, uh, the proud, controlling, self-righteous hearts of the religious leaders in the last passage leads to Jesus' withdrawal from their presence. And now they will not hear the words of life unless they humble themselves, as some of them will, and seek him as a teacher. But others do seek him. All of these people, this, this great mixed multitude with all kinds of different baggage, all kinds of different issues, all kinds of different backgrounds, they are seeking Jesus. And primarily Jewish still at this point, but not quite the elite, not quite the purebred, not quite the ones that are going to be the most respectable. So what do we say to this just right out the bat? Don't let sin keep you from truth and salvation. Nothing you have will comfort you more than Jesus in the end. And how sad it is for those who choose their pride or their control or their tradition or whatever their thing is, rather than the often uncomfortable truth of God that saves us. Because while the truth of God is often uncomfortable, it is what we need. And we see that here as we continue through verse 12. He spake to his disciples that a small ship should wait for him because of the multitude, lest they should throng him. For he healed many. So he gets out on a boat, either as he's teaching or um, <clears throat> as he's preparing to teach, in case the crowd gets a little bit too wild. And he healed many, insomuch as they pressed upon him for to touch him. For many had plague, and as many as had plagues. Unclean spirits, when they saw him, fell down before him and cried, Thou art the Son of God. The devils are just compelled to acknowledge who he is. And he charges them that they should not make it known. He doesn't want to hear it. He doesn't want to hear anything from them. We've talked about that several times over the course of previous Mark videos. And so this is an amazing thing. Jesus withdraws himself from the religious elite who have come to accuse him, but he's showing these great wonders and these works of power to the common people that are willing to hear him, that are willing to come out and see him. And they're being blessed even while the establishment is stopping up its ears. Don't stop up your ears. Be willing to receive the truth and be blessed. And so now we see the Lord call the twelve. He goes to a mountain and he calls all whom he would. And they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him. These are the twelve apostles. Uh, and we're going to talk about them in turn. But And he sends them forth to preach, to have power, to heal sickness, to cast out devils. Notice that Jesus delegates here. Jesus gives them twelve, gives the twelve power. And the twelve are not, not perfect people by any means. Simon, the son of Peter, James, the son of Deb Zebedee, John, the brother of James, uh, Let's do it this way. We'll look at this note. So I have some references here. You can pause this and look this up if you want to uh, cross-reference this and do a deeper study. The New Testament contains four lists of the 12 apostles. Peter's always first because he's the leader of the apostles. Judas Iscariot is always last because he's the traitor. Some of the lists have slightly different names. Uh, one reason for that is that it was common for people to have two names that they would go by. Matthew Levi is a good example of that. Simon Peter is another good example of that. Sometimes it would be the same name, but in a different language. 
And sometimes people had, very often, people went by a family name too. Uh, we see this in our passage today, Bartholomew, Bar in, uh, in the Semitic languages. Uh, things, phrases like Bar in Semitic languages or Ben, uh, they mean son essentially or son of. So Bartholomew uh, would be like son of Tholomew or he would probably say son of Ptolemy or son of Ptolemy. So they have different names, kind of like we have a first name, a middle name, and a last name. Not exactly like that, but they have different names. And that's why you see the names differ a little bit sometimes in the lists. What's really striking about the, the apostles is how uninteresting and unremarkable they are. Yeah, Peter's a character, Judas is a traitor, but if you look at, look at what we know of them, they're just a collection of poor, uneducated, rustic people. Some of, them, some of them were a little bit more wealthy. Some of them had bad reputations, Matthew, Levi. Some of them were political uh, activists, but they weren't the kind of people that you would necessarily want to get together to start an organization. Yet God calls them to serve with him. And as Jesus leads them up to this mountain and names them as his 12 and calls them into service and sends them out to be a witness, we should be thinking of another time when God called a group of people to a mountain into his service and not, not the most powerful group of people in the world. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more numerous than any people, for you were the fewest of people, but because the Lord loved you, because he would keep the oath which he swore unto your fathers. Has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondmen and, and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Therefore, know or know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God. He is faithful, which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. We should be thinking of Israel. The church does not replace Israel. The church is not the new Israel. But we see in the church the, conti the continuation and the completeness of God's plan. God has called these 12 very regular, plain, messed up people into his holy service. Just as God called the 12 tribes who had a lot of baggage going all the way back to the 12 fathers into the same holy service. Not quite the same exactly as God works in a different dispensation, but still into the holy service. What we see here, what we see in this passage is God working in the weak, God working in the small, God working in the scarred. Rejoice that God works in the weak and the small and the messed up. Rest in his power and work to be faithful alongside of him because he calls us to service with him. And that's just an astounding thing. He could do it all himself or he could do none of it, but he made us to fellowship with him and so he calls us to work side by side with him. So what does that mean? What does this mean to us? Well, notice what keeps people from God and notice what draws people to God in our passage. And go back to the original question. What's the essential difference between a wise person and a fool? From a biblical perspective, the essential difference is that a wise person is teachable. A five-year-old that is teachable is more wise than a college professor who thinks he knows everything and has become unteachable in his old age. That person is a fool. The unteachable person, however much they think they know, however much they know, however much they've done, the unteachable person is a fool and the teachable person is on the road to wisdom. If we have a very high view of ourselves, we are kept estranged from God because we are unteachable, because we will not humble ourselves and stoop to listen. Don't let a high view of yourself keep you estranged from God and out of fellowship with others. Flock to the joy of the Lord because it, he can give you the things that will comfort you. But you have to be willing to learn. You have to be willing to accept the hard truths that the religious leaders in the last passage and in this passage are not willing to accept. The other side of that, don't let a low view of yourself keep you estranged from God and out of fellowship while others are flocking into the joy of the Lord because God is able to help you. He is able. We don't see it in this passage, but it would be just as easy for the poor, for the disenfranchised, for the messed up people to say, oh, there's no help for me, woe is me, I, nobody can help me, and stay away from Jesus. It would be just as easy for that to happen as it would be for the proud people to stay away from Jesus for their own reasons, because they have a high view of themselves. The theme here is self-centeredness. There's two ways to be obsessed with yourself, obsessed high or obsessed low. 
Either of those ways will estrange you from God and the fellowship and the joy that comes with a walking relationship with God. Set your eyes upon Jesus and be teachable. I hope this has been helpful. I'm Pastor Schuyler with Berean Baptist Church. You'll find information about our church in the video description below. If this is helpful to you, I encourage you to share it with others, to subscribe. We are doing gospel Bible studies in the Gospel of Mark three days a week, uh, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. They're posting until at least until I recover from my pneumonia. But I look forward to uh, continuing Mark with you. God bless. Love, 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 love.